I wanted to go back to, you had mentioned how probably the largest victims of cancel culture are Palestinians and people who have spoken out for Palestinian rights. I know you don't see yourself as a victim, but do you see yourself as part of that? I mean, is that, do you think that's why you are no longer with MSNBC? That's a great question. <laughs> See, you, you are good at yeah, these good stuff interviews. You, Maddie. <laughs> um, you better have lots of follow-ups. Um, the look, I left MSNBC on January seventh. I announced I was live. I was quitting. Um, I they were very good to let me negotiate a quick exit so I could go off and do my own thing now. Yeah. They cancelled the shows. I think end of November it was where they announced they were cancelling the shows. That was obviously disappointing. Who wants their shows to be cancelled? Nobody. Um, and uh, I mean, you, you've been through the I MSNBC have, I've been there. Yeah. Uh, machine. You would have to ask MSNBC why they did what they did. People have speculated. People have come up with their reasoning. I have, uh, I did my coverage the way I wanted to do my coverage. And even pre-October 7th, a lot of people just woke up to Palestine on October 7th. I was covering it for MSNBC for three and a half years. I covered in 2021 when Biden became president. You remember there was a, was it 11-day bombing campaign of Gaza by Netanyahu then? I grilled an Israeli embassy spokesman at the time, which went viral for MSNBC and no one had any issues. And it was gr it was very well-received interview. Um, you know, I covered Shirin Abu Akhla's killing. Mm -hmm. um, we, uh, I did segments on apartheid and the A-word, which my colleague Ali Velshi, who is still at MSNBC. And he was, does a I good think, job too. Yeah. Was I think the first person on cable to really uh, talk about the A-word in the context of Israel-Palestine. Um, so I did all of that. And I, all I can say is I never censored myself. I said what I had to do. I interviewed the people I wanted. One of my last interviews was Mark Regev, uh, the Netanyahu spokesman. Yep. Um, and uh, why did MSNBC cancel my shows? You'd have to ask MSNBC. So there was reporting uh, very soon after October 7th about how you and Ali Valshi and Eamon Moyle-Dean were being, your roles were being diminished um, as part of the, the coverage of, you know, October 7th and then Israel's assault on Gaza. I mean, did you feel pressure being applied to you? You may not have succumbed to that pressure. I think that's clear from your work product. But was there pressure applied to you? I remember watching the ADL dude going on Morning Black, Joe yeah. and saying, oh, is mm -hmm. it Hamas that's writing these scripts, you know, these terrorist yep. talking points? Did you feel that while you were there? So when I was there, as I say, there's, all news organizations had multiple discussions about how to cover this. It was a, a rolling story. It was a shocking story. Um, obviously, I'm bound by what I can talk about sure. uh, as a former employee and in terms of sharing. And I'm, I'm also just in my nature. I'm not someone who throws former colleagues under the bus. I've had my differences with many people at The Intercept. Some have come out in the open. I've tried to keep most uh, behind closed doors. <laughs> uh, there were things I didn't agree with at Al Jazeera English. Um, so, but I, I, I hate these people who kind of and I'm not going to name names, but people who kind of just gratuitously throw people on the bus. Um, look, conversations were had, lots of conversations were had about editorial directions, about tone, about coverage. That's to be expected in every place. All I can say, and I can only speak for myself, is that I said what I had to say, I did what I had to do, and I asked the questions I wanted to ask. That's how I left MSNBC, and that's what I will always do. And And anyone who knows me knows that's how I operate. Crystal, you've talked about some uh, instances you faced when you were at MSNBC uh, about how you gave a monologue basically saying, you know, please, Hillary, don't run. I don't remember what year this was. 2014? 2014, you yeah. did that. And then, you know, you thought nothing of it. You did it. And then afterwards, higher ups came to you and were basically like, if you're going to do a monologue on Hillary Clinton again, you have to run it by Yeah, it wasn't you can't do it. It's that the if literal president of the network has to approve any future commentary about Hillary Clinton because, I mean, basically what I was told is that a call came in from the Hillary camp. They're very upset about this monologue and they were, you know, oh, you're going to be unfair to us and we're not going to give you access effectively. And so the that was one where the edict literally did sort of come down from the top. And, you know, you, you said, and I, and I believe you because I saw your coverage, that whatever you know, conversations were had, didn't impact you saying and covering the conflict the way that you felt appropriate. For myself, I mean, I can't rule out that that thought of that subconsciously scrutiny. Subconsciously got to you. Subconsciously, yes, right. yeah. I mean, yeah. you can't, you're a human but, okay, being, so let's right? Take a, let's take a step back then. Let's take a step back to the big picture. Yeah. Big picture, I've worked at the BBC, Sky News, and ITV News in the UK behind the scenes as a producer, sometimes very senior producer. Uh, I worked at Al Jazeera English. English. Mm -hmm. English. I worked at The Intercept, and I worked at NBC News in front of the camera as a as an on-screen personality. In all of those places, 
there were, of course, there were pressures. There were corporate pressures, yeah. financial pressures, ideological pressures. Anyone who claims, and this, we're going to get into kind of Noam Chomsky territory, that you know, that you can just ignore all that stuff. Of course not. Of course that applies. I've never claimed that there's not a trade-off right. for those of us who are on the left working within mainstream media. The issue is, where is that trade-off? Where is the line? And is it worth it? Right. And I remember when yeah, I did my right. when I did my book when I when I released Win Every Argument last year I went on a book tour and I'm going to do a shameless plug. It's out this week in paperback. I want to talk about <laughs> that a little bit. Yeah. When when I did the book tour for that last year we did an event at Politics and Prose and you can watch it on YouTube with with my former colleague Jen Saki, and somebody in the audience said to me came up to the mic we did a Q and A and he said young kid and I feel so bad because I was very aggressive in my response turns out he was a fan and he was just expressing himself <laughs> not in the best way I got defensive and when I get defensive I get aggressive bad habit he said to me I've been following you for years and you called out Saudi Arabia and you called out Israel and you called out America and now you work in corporate media you still and do I said, those things yeah. and can you point to me where I haven't been calling out Saudi Arabia, Israel, or American foreign policy? And he goes, yeah, yeah, okay, fair enough. And, <laughs> and, and after he said that, he was actually a fan. He wasn't criticizing me. He just anyway. wanted to raise the point. He yeah. wanted to raise the point. But my point being, there's a balancing act. And I know there are some purists. I'm sure some listeners of this show will say no one should ever have anything to do with mainstream media. They're beyond. I don't agree with that. I don't agree I, with that either. I, I'm not of the view that we should have no voices in corporate media or mainstream media. And nor am I do that everyone who works in those places is a sellout or has had to sell their soul. I would argue that me and a bunch of other people, I'm not going to take their names and embarrass them, have actually managed to do a great job in mainstream media right. in terms of staying true to their principles, in terms of giving a voice to the voices, in terms of being truthful, in terms of giving historical and political context. I mean, for me, I'll, I'll, I will take this to my grave. You know the highlight from what? No, there's many highlights. One of the big highlights of me working at MSNBC for three and a half years as a British American brown Muslim lefty immigrant from Al Jazeera in the Intercept turns up at NBC Universal. I get an email one day from Noam Chomsky mm. who says, and I quote, and we all wish Noam the best of health right now. He says, In 25 years, I've never been invited on MSNBC. You're the first person to ever invite me on MSNBC. Wow. Wow. In, fact, I got him, in fact, I got him on twice. Wow. Um, so for me, I'm like, yeah, I didn't need to do that. And I'm not trying to brag. It's not a brag or a humble brag or whatever it is. It's just a factual statement. <laughs> a I didn't bar. need to get Noam Chomsky on, yeah. but I got him on. I didn't need to get certain voices on. And I believe that was of value. Well, and I know that's of value because when I left, a lot of people reached out to me and said, you were the person getting these voices on. Yeah. So I do believe there should be people working in those spaces. So I'm going to ask you, I know you said you're, you're not going to brag. I'm going to ask you to brag now, though. Right. Because I didn't say I don't love my, brag. I just wasn't <laughs> bragging at the time. Because Happy to brag now. My reading of the situation as an outsider is that I think if you were given a prime time show at the 8 o'clock slot or, you know, whatever, you could have easily been the face of the network. And I think you could have definitely surpassed Chris Hayes' numbers, no offense to Chris Hayes. Maddow's numbers, no offense to Rachel Maddow. But, like, you're tailor-made for that position, but you weren't given that position. And so do you view that the same as I view that? That it, it's almost like there are points deducted because you're so outspoken, because you're on the left. So, again, it, it, these are difficult conversations for me to have for obvious reasons, but I would say this, just state the stuff that's on the public record. I did guest host many of those shows that you mentioned. To be fair to MSNBC, they gave me a lot of opportunities. I, at certain times, I'd be like, what am I doing here? Why am I at 9 o'clock presenting live on MSNBC when a year ago I was just this random dude that a few people read here and there? So they did give me opportunities. I sat in for Rachel Maddow. I sat in for Alex Wagner. I sat in for Chris Hayes. I sat in for uh, Ali Velshi uh, and multiple other people, uh, Lawrence O'Donnell. I did get those opportunities, and you feel like the kid who's been allowed to drive the parents' nice car, you're like, take it for a spin, am I going to break it? Um, and I got good numbers and got good guests. And so that, therefore, it, it, it's a little, it's hard to come up with a simple explanation for what happened, and that's why I don't offer one. I don't want to speculate, and I say each to their own. I can only tell you that, you know, I enjoyed my run there, and they canceled their shows, which is their right to do. But on the other hand, you know, they canceled my shows, but they also gave me great opportunities in primetime. Yeah, well, I'll, I'll also... Which they didn't need to do, right? That's true, but I'll, you, I'll also say in response to the Cenk Uger, he has his story from when he was over there, that he was on, I believe, the 6 o'clock time slot it was, and he had the best numbers that they ever had in that time slot, and then they pulled him into the office, whoever the president was at the time, and basically told him, like, you know, we got to work on your tone. Our friends in Washington don't like your tone. And well, it's because he was going, at the time, he was going very aggressively against the Obama administration, I think, uh, uh, in, involving Egypt, Egypt policy. And so that 
was his sort of like, here's the moment that. Well, let me make a, let me make a generic point about media in general, which is again going back to Chomsky and ideology and and manufacturing consent and the rest. I mean, it's not always about numbers and money and profit, is it? That's the point. I mean, Tucker Carlson found this out at Fox. Right. The guy's yeah. the highest rated host. If you told mm -hmm. me the night before he was fired, Tucker Carlson's going to get fired. Over him. They can't fire Tucker Carlson. Yeah. They can actually. They can. Yeah. yeah. So, well, especially uh, yeah, that's because not that I wept you just made my own point for me Tucker better Carlson. than I made it for me. Well, especially because um, just in terms of the business model, you know, these are MSNBC is a tiny blip on the bottom line of a gigantic corporation. This is only a little piece of the interview. You definitely want to see the whole thing. We talked to Mehdi about a million different things, so definitely check it out. The link below to Substack. You could sign up, pay five bucks a month and get the video of every interview and get it a day early, or you could sign up for free and get the audio podcast full thing delivered right to your email inbox. Love you guys. Thanks.